So uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Hopefully I uh, can take control here. All right, uh, my disclosures are really not relevant to this talk. Um, as you just heard, the pallet harness is the most widely used device in North America for treating DDH and success rates for mild dysplasia are nearly 100%, while the success rates for true dislocations are a little bit more modest, around 70 to 90%. So the point here is that uh, a discrete minority of dislocated hips will fail treatment and early recognition of this issue is important because persistent use of the harness in the face of a dislocation can result in the so-called pavlic harness disease, which can complicate subsequent treatment. So there's several reasons for why a pavlic might fail, and the bulk of this talk is gonna focus on these different mechanisms and how to deal with them. So reason number one is uh, improper harness fit. So as you just heard uh, from Salil, obviously the harness is only gonna work if it's fitted right. Premies and neonates are often too small for even the smallest harness, and sometimes you have to delay treatment until they're a little bit bigger. At the other end of the spectrum, although they've had success in San Diego, many people uh, start becoming a little bit more reticent in using a harness over six months of age because the infants are larger and they can kind of overpower a harness. So in any infant who's failing treatment, you gotta make sure that the fit is uh, accurate before you abandon treatment. So, um, as a bit of a review, because you already heard this, uh, you know there, there is a design to the way the pavlic harness is set up. Um, the chest straps should be positioned at the nipple line by adjusting the height of the shoulder straps. The anterior straps set the amount of hip flexion and they should run along the anterior axillary line. They usually position the hips in about 90 degrees of hip flexion. And the posterior or the abduction straps run posterior to the thigh and they should not result in forced abduction as this can increase the risk of AVN. Uh, reason number two for the pavlic failure is poor patient compliance as close follow up and ultrasound is really needed to monitor progress and adjust the harness accordingly. Obviously, this is not a factor that's entirely in our control as, as uh, providers, but patient education and empowerment is really important to help improve our outcomes. Femoral nerve palsy can be a reason for pavlic failure, and this has been associated with excessive hip flexion in the harness. The Texas Scottish Rite study published in JVGS reported the incidence to be around 2.5%. Risk factors for this series were larger, heavier infants, as well as increasing disease severity. Now, all the policies were covered, but the time to resolution varies significantly, as you can see in this bar graph. The presence of a palsy has a major impact on pavlic success. So 47% of those with femoral nerve palsy were successfully treated with a harness compared to 94% of controls. And the time to resolution affected the eventual success rate of the harness. In order to maximize the chances of the pavlic working, the authors recommended that you uh, try to adjust the harness to less flexion or just temporarily halt the harness rather than getting large gaps in treatment uh, that can really affect your outcomes. Um, so reason number four uh, for why the pavlic might fail is persistent dysplasia. So in the setting of an adequate reduction, this may not indicate failure of the harness per se, but rather insufficient length of treatment. The alpha angle on the initial ultrasound is shown to be predictive of uh, the risk of having residual dysplasia down the road, and prolonged management of both the harness or brace may be needed to completely resolve S tender dysplasia in certain infants. However, this can be hard with the advancing age as children become more mobile and parents start to fatigue of treatment. A study out of our institution found that part-time bracing can be effective for improving acetabular indices in older infants. Keep in mind that the prevalence of residual radiographic dysplasia, even after successful treatment, has been reported to be anywhere from 5 to 30 percent. And so, as you've heard already today, most of us recommend uh, radiographic follow-up throughout growth to monitor for this. Uh, reason number five uh, by which the fabric may fail is if the hip won't stabilize even if it's reduced. So this may indicate insufficient length of treatment or inadequate rigidity of the device. If you've been treating for a while and things remain unstable, consider an underlying ligamentous laxity condition or a syndrome. And also be sure you do indeed have a deep concentric reduction by double checking the ultrasound to confirm the absence of a structural impediment to reduction. Um, if your uh, reduction is good and the hip just won't stabilize then you can stay the course with the pavlic. You can consider a more rigid orthosis like an Ilfeld or a plastisode abduction brace. Rarely closed reduction and spiky casting is necessary and open reduction with the capsulography with or without a pelvic osteotomy is really reserved for much older infants who have continued and persistent instability. The last mode in which the pavlic uh, may fail is if the hip won't reduce at all. And as discussed, this can occur in 10 to 30% of dislocated hips uh, being treated with the pavlic. Now, risk factors for failure include bilateral dislocations, irreducibility on initial physical exam, and increasing severity of displacement. Um, potential causes for failed reduction include extraarticular soft tissue contractures, mechanical blocks within the joint, and improper positioning in the device for that particular hip, or insufficient rigidity of the orthosis. Ultrasounds are extremely useful to identify the cause, as in this example, where uh, we have an infilled labrum that's partially responsible for the persistent subluxation. <laughs> 
As mentioned earlier, the harness should generally be abandoned after three or four weeks to avoid developing pelvic harness disease, although occasionally I will go longer if I'm seeing some progressive improvement in the hip. At the end of the day, though, if the hip still won't reduce, you have to abandon the harness, and there are several other options that you can consider. So McLean described a modification of the pavlik in which the posterior abduction straps are rerouted around the flexion straps to maintain increased abduction uh, and reported on three patients in which this was successful after failure of standard pavlik fitting. The use of a rigid abduction orthosis for infants failing pavlik has been described, but it's had mixed results in the literature. Hedegwist out of Boston, uh, along with Jim Casper, reported an 82% success rate with the plasticine orthosis following a failed pavlik. But a follow-up study in Los Angeles by Ibrahim, however, uh, found that abduction bracing was of no benefit. Our own anecdotal experience at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has been that abduction bracing can be quite effective for this application. As a result, we designed and completed this study uh, several years ago, um, looking at a cohort of 28 hips with DDH under six months of age who had failed a pavlic harness and were treated with the brace that we like, which is the Ilfeld orthosis, and compared this to 22 hips that went directly to close reduction and spike of casting after pavlic failure. In the end, 23 out of 28 of our hips in our bracing cord were successfully stabilized with the Ilfeld brace, with three requiring closed reduction and two in open reduction. Meantime, the Ilfeld brace was 11 weeks, and there were no complications in this cohort. 22 out of 22 hips in the closed reduction group uh, were stabilized, uh, with two hips requiring an open reduction. In the meantime, the cast was 14 weeks, with most infants undergoing a cast change uh, during the process under anesthesia. Uh, at one-year follow-up, we found no significant difference uh, between the two cords in terms of residual radiographic dysplasia. Interestingly, according to Salter's criteria, we found uh, three cases of, um, uh, of AVN uh, in the closed reduction cord compared to none in the bracing cohort. So our 82% success rate that we found with the Ilfell brace following pelvic failure was consistent with Hedequist's results and comparable to our own results following closed reduction and spike of casting. Because of the uh, ability to uh, potentially have a lower AVN rate as well as avoid the burden of spica casting as well as the exposure to general anesthesia, we concluded that the Ilfeld brace should be considered as the next line of treatment following failed pathic prior to proceeding with closed reduction and spica casting. So here's an example from our series uh, of a, a one-week-old infant. Uh, here's what it looks like after four weeks in the harness. You can see the clear persistence of the dislocation. Two weeks after being switched to an Ilfeld, the hip has reduced, and by the end of bracing, the hip has, uh, has normalized. Another option for a failed pavlik is traction. Uh, this is probably best for overcoming extra-articular soft tissue contractures, uh, like a tight psoas or an adductor. Uh, there are reports of traction being used after a failed pavlik, followed by reinstitution of a pavlik. Uh, there are also several reports of traction being followed by spica casting in, uh, with good results. Uh, I've not had a lot of experience with this, uh, and it's not performed a lot in North America. Another option, of course, for treating a failed pavlik is a formal closed reduction uh, and spike casting under general anesthesia in the operating room. This is typically formed with an arthrogram uh, to judge the adequacy of the reduction and sometimes a tenotomy uh, to uh, help uh, improve the safe zone of the reduction. If you have a true intraarticular block, however, uh, or more severe soft tissue contracture than a formal open reduction would be necessary, you'll hear a lot about this uh, in the subsequent talks. This can be formed through a medial or an anterior approach. And, and again, you're gonna hear more about this later today. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I'd say the pelvic harness is generally successful, but failures absolutely do occur. Early recognition is important to try to avoid pelvic harness disease. And if things aren't going well, consider the six mechanisms of failure that we talked about, as this can guide your potential solution. And there are several options after failure of the pelvic, including uh, rigid bracing, traction, and closed and open reduction. Thank you.